Las Vegas, October 1993. In a city bent on erasing its past, a symbol of all that Vegas was, the Dunes Hotel and Casino, is given a spectacular funeral. Captain of the Britannia, prepare broadside. Ready, aim, fire! And then a pause, as if the proud ghosts of the mob might rise up and defy the future. is one of the last of the pure, dark-hearted mob hotels. Its implosion was a tremendous image. The old Las Vegas is in rubble. In its wake, a new Vegas was emerging. Gone were the old mob families and their world of danger and intrigue. Now Vegas was selling family values and good, clean fun. But was the mob really gone? And how had it come to rule Vegas in the first place? It's a saga of American justice driven by murder, desperate ambition, dreams of paradise, and above all, greed. The reigning lords of the Strip would rather bury the bad old days when the Mafia skimmed millions from casino counting rooms and hold out the cash in stuffed suitcases. But the truth is, the mob built Vegas, and the mob made it work. In this special two-hour episode of American Justice, we'll relive the mob's rise and fall from the beginning, how Nevada legalized gambling and mobsters suddenly fell in love with the desert. Everything was legal. They must have thought they died and went to heaven. How Vegas would become the mob paradise, biggest racket since bootlegging, a Niagara Falls of money. What the mob wanted to do was take its cut of the water as it went by, and that's what the scam was. A sweet business for the mob, with no heat from local officials, because for Vegas to succeed, the city needed mobsters. They knew more about running casinos than anyone in America, so even if they were stealing, they were still welcome. It was almost as though, hey, they deserve it, because if it wasn't for them, we'd still be a barren desert. How they held sway for decades and then blew it. When a mob frontman tried to act as if he was really the boss, the bosses back home put the newcomer in his place. The bottom line becomes, uh, if necessary, we'll kill you. And when the wise guys started playing by new deadly rules and leaving dead bodies in the desert, the heat was on. Now the feds were listening. Paradise would come crashing down. And as it did, the mob would take revenge on those within its ranks whom it held responsible. One major target, a Chicago hitman, whose battered corpse was discovered in an Indiana cornfield. His burial is the metaphor for the burial of the mob in Vegas. He used to say people, when they find out about this place, are not going to Monte Carlo. They're going to come here. We're only 300 miles from L.A. And it's going to be tremendous. Nevada, true to its Wild West heritage, has always had great respect for gamblers. The state made it official in 1931 and became the only place in the country with legalized casinos. At first, the mob barely noticed. Las Vegas was little more than a desert way station, a hick town 18 hours by plane from New York. Then, in the mid-30s, construction of the colossal Hoover Dam brought the town a boom. Workers flocked to Vegas for weekend getaways and crowded into the sawdust joints. The, the sawdust joint had card tables. It had uh, some slot machines. And it was only a hop, skip, and a jump from what we call Block 16. Block 16 were the bordellos. Downtown was also where the train station stopped, where all the travelers, I guess you'd call them travelers, 
but we called them suckers in those days. They would get off to stretch their legs and have a meal. They would wind up in the gambling halls and uh, over at Block 16 and probably miss their train. Vegas began to mean something much bigger to the mob when Nevada took a further step. The state legalized betting on horse race results in 1941. That summer, an enterprising and trigger-happy Jewish gangster named Benjamin Bugsy Siegel and his sidekick, Mo Sedway, decided to take a closer look at Las Vegas, along with Mo's wife, B. Ben, Moe, and I were the first ones to go down into Las Vegas. And we rode down the hill, and I didn't know where they were going. They had uh, just two roads going down. And if somebody was coming one way, or a, a few more cars, they had to move over. Bugsy saw an opportunity to expand the lucrative racket he was already running on behalf of his bosses in the Italian mob back in New York. Controlling illegal wire services on the West Coast. Wires which reported horse race results to bookies. By controlling the wires, the mob controlled the bookies. Now the wire was legal in Nevada. So Bugsy, on orders from New York, set up shop in Vegas. Using the threat of violence, he forced every sawdust gambling joint to take the mob's wire service. Bugsy tried to push his way into it and did. I mean, he didn't just push his way in, he established the wire service and you had to take it. Popular legend credits Bugsy as having the inspiration for modern Las Vegas. Not true. In reality, Siegel merely followed a trail pioneered by others. The El Rancho, a western-style hotel casino, was already completed when Bugsy came to town. It was like four miles from Las Vegas. You had to drive through the desert to get there. And everyone was saying, who would build a hotel four miles out of the town? I mean, who's going to go? The El Rancho was followed in 1942 by The Last Frontier, both located on Highway 91, what would later be known as The Strip. During World War II, thousands of soldiers who were sent to train in the desert made their way to Las Vegas. Hotel casinos like the El Rancho and Last Frontier were raking in the profits. The town was very small, and everybody wore Western, but Las Vegas was a, a, a going town. Bugsy's bookmaking racket shared in the wartime expansion, but it was the casino owners who made the real killing, and Bugsy wanted a piece of that action. In 1946, he got his chance. A new casino was under construction at the far southern end of Highway 91, the Flamingo. The Flamingo was the brainchild of a suave Los Angeles restaurateur and gambling addict named Billy Wilkerson. Instead of the howdy-doody atmosphere of the El Rancho and Last Frontier, the Flamingo would be something new. It would bring the luxury and sophistication of his L.A. night spots to Vegas. Not a sawdust joint, but a carpet joint. Only Wilkerson had run out of money, so Bugsy offered to invest in the failing project. Wilkerson, of course, was going to be his partner. But like most people that aren't in the mob, you don't become a partner for long. So Billy was squeezed out, and Bugsy took over the whole operation. There was a time here when people weren't uh, quite so hypocritical when I, just because a guy was a felon didn't mean he was a bad guy. By 1946, Siegel's consuming passion was building the Flamingo. All he'd wanted to talk about was the Flamingo. It was like a dream of his. But to his mob bosses back east, few of whom saw any promise in the rugged wasteland of southern Nevada, Siegel's desert dream was a mirage. Meyer Lansky, Siegel's boyhood friend and mob financial wizard stepped in and helped Siegel convince the bosses to invest. The only problem was that Siegel was both a terrible businessman and an overzealous developer who kept finding new ways to improve the project. He just wanted it perfect. I saw him one time turn all one side out and have him move the pool and tear all the, the back wall out of it. I think he did that back wall three times. Despite his constant remodeling, Bugsy managed to get the hotel ready in time for opening night, Christmas, 1946. But Lady Luck would not be on his side. 
The first opening night it rained, it poured down rain, and all the people that were supposed to come, all the entertainers and the movie people and everything, nobody showed up. Nor, once the fanfare died down, did the locals. They weren't used to carpet joints. When they first opened the Flamingo, everybody wore, wore tuxedos, and they didn't let anybody in unless they were dressed. Well, everybody in Las Vegas wore Western clothes. Cowboy boots and hats, maybe, but black tie, no. So nobody in Las Vegas was welcome at the Flamingo. Worse, through a disastrous combination of novice dealers, lucky gamblers, and unfinished hotel rooms, the Flamingo's bankroll was wiped out in less than a month. In January 1947, Siegel was forced to close the doors. But within months, new mob funds from back east enabled Bugsy to finish the hotel and reopen. This time, he got it right. Now it wasn't long before the money flowed, straight into the gangsters' pockets. Well, sometimes they skinned. Well, I guess they almost always did a little bit for themselves. But everybody made money. Now, they did not have watchers as they do now. They did not have people watching the count in the counting rooms. So the skim was enormous. The best part was the counting rooms. I was always piling hundred dollar bills and things into books and somebody bumped into me one of the fellas and I fell and dropped the book and the hundreds were flying all over so when I looked up at, at everybody they were just smiling they all laughed and they never let on like here's all this money floating around but despite the Flamingo's turnaround, Siegel had overplayed his hand. All the guys all over New York were complaining. What was supposed to be built for a million dollars. And it wound up, it was already up to six or seven million by then. In those days, that was a lot of money. Too much for his partners. I guess it could have been around midnight. They called me to come to the main office. They said, Willow, Mr. Siegel has been killed. On the evening of June 20th, 1947, in classic mob fashion, Bugsy was gunned down in the Beverly Hills home of his notorious mob girlfriend, Virginia Hill. The mob didn't kill people in Vegas. It was only minutes after Siegel's death that three colleagues of his walked in and said, uh, okay, uh, everybody continue your job, except you're now reporting to us. We are taking over the Flamingo. One of the men who took over that night was a Phoenix bookmaker named Gus Greenbaum. Nobody even had an idea who Gus Greenbaum was. He was just a, a businessman, they, they thought. They didn't even know he was a Chicago mob. That didn't come till later. As Greenbaum established control over the Flamingo, Local Nevada law enforcement was not wasting much time worrying about the shady backgrounds of the new casino owners. But American justice was about to open its eyes. In May 1950, Senator Estes Kefauver of Tennessee launched an investigation into organized crime and what he called America's number one evil, gambling. The televised Kefauver hearings shone a spotlight on scores of mobsters, including those active in Vegas. What Kefauver did was point out that, in fact, the mob was involved in Las Vegas. What this did to the state of Nevada was scare them to death because it meant possible federal intervention. And if the feds come in, the state loses its power. Not wanting to lose its precious control over the hot gambling business, Nevada set some new ground rules, stating that organized crime figures would be prohibited from owning casinos. The problem is they grandfathered in everybody who had been licensed up to that time, which included people who had been convicted of murder, um, people who were part of organized crime, who just should never have been licensed. The Kefauver hearings had another unintended side effect. They made the strip even more popular to criminals of every kind. After the Kefauver hearings, it was a, just a mass migration of racket guys, of gamblers and bookmakers, loan sharks, that sort of thing. They basically kind of did a Damon Runyon shuffle all the way across America and wound up in southern Nevada. And all were welcome. There were people from Detroit, and there were people from Cleveland, and there were people from Kansas City. And the more hotels that would go in would have a head guy that was 
Mafia. They were the, the guys who were watching the money. And they all dressed alike. They all wore black suits, white shirts, and white ties. I mean, they weren't in disguise. We knew who they were. But that was it. They never bothered you. Uh, if you didn't get involved with them, you never knew they were there. And the mob wanted it that way. Early on, the powerful mob bosses of Chicago and the East had decreed that Vegas, unlike other areas of the country, would be an open city. What the mob said is that Las Vegas is an open city. It's going to be the, one of those cities where we will not kill each other for control. From the residents' point of view, I imagine they were thinking, yeah, this, this is kind of exciting. We've got people who have this somewhat shady background, but they're not doing anything bad here. For the visitors, the gangster mystique had cachet as well. 1955 saw the Strip's greatest expansion to date, with the opening of four new luxury hotel casinos. The few people that found the hideaway of Las Vegas liked the idea of rubbing elbows with somebody with a dark suit and a cigar and a movie star, a movie star at the next table. And with their frontier mentality, the locals cared little that the man with the dark suit and cigar might be a gangster as long as the violence was kept out of Vegas. The mob would stick by that rule in dealing with Bugsy's successor at the Flamingo, Gus Greenbaum. Greenbaum had managed the Flamingo well and in 1955 retired to his home in Phoenix. But his retirement wouldn't last. In March 1955, a group of Miami investors had just completed a new $10 million nine-story hotel called the Riviera. Unfortunately, they soon ran out of money. Now a Chicago group was ready to step in, and Chicago mob boss Tony Accardo wanted a pro to run the place. So he paid a personal visit to Green Palm in Phoenix. He said he wanted Gus to return to Vegas to salvage the Riviera. But Green Palm refused to go back, a dangerous decision. A week later, someone sent him a message. They killed his sister-in-law to get him into the Riviera. They came in the house and put a pillow over her face and killed her, splintered her to death. And then the next, uh, at the end of the week, Gus called and said, I'm going to be in Las Vegas. Greenbaum was back. He ran the Riviera just as well as he had run the Flamingo. But Greenbaum was slowly succumbing to a drug addiction, and the bosses were not happy. I had no idea anything was wrong, but evidently something was going wrong with Greenbaum. He was getting older, he had bad asthma, he was hooked on, on uh, heroin for his asthma. And then I heard rumors that they wanted him out and he didn't want to go. The rumors were correct. Just as they had done with Bugsy Siegel 11 years earlier, the mob decided that Gus Greenbaum was a business liability. He'd gone down to Phoenix to spend the weekend with his wife, and during the night, somebody came in, cut his throat, he's in bed, killed him waited for his wife to come home, hit her over the head, and then cut her throat. The casinos were being built by mobsters, people who couldn't go to legitimate financial institutions like banks. So they needed a way to get the money to build these giant resorts. And the Teamsters was their bank. I referred to it as the money store for the mob. By the mid-1950s, the mob was facing a new problem in Las Vegas. The city was poised to become a modern gambling and entertainment mecca. More planes were flying there. New highways were leading there. But mob bosses around the country were in a bond. They needed cash to build new casinos, only they didn't want to use their own. The Nevada legislature was beginning its campaign to keep mobsters and their money off the strip. And the normal route, borrowing money from a bank, was out of the question. No bank in America was going to open a branch office in southern Nevada uh, and begin lending millions of dollars to these characters. So the bosses turned to a trusted ally and boss in his own right, Teamsters president Jimmy Hoffa. Through Hoffa, the mob would find the motherload of cash it needed to finance paradise for decades to come. A complex deal which would take American justice years to unravel. Hoffa's link to the mob went back to 1949, when the ambitious union organizer met a racketeer and political fixer in Chicago named Paul Red Dorfman. 
Red Dorfman was from the area of Al Capone. He was being dated back all the way back to Al Capone. And he had mob connections. Connections which could be crucial if Hoffa were to achieve his life's ambition to become president of the Teamsters. The union leadership in each of the hundreds of locals voted for uh, uh, the president so that um, if you control the locals, you control who the president was, and the mob controlled a whole lot of the locals. So Dorfman and Hoffa made a deal. The Chicago mob would support Hoffa if Hoffa would give a huge piece of Teamster insurance business to Dorfman's 23-year-old stepson, Alan, whose only training was as a gym teacher. In 1955, Hoffa won the presidency of the Teamsters. One of his first steps was to create the Central States Pension Fund, an ever-expanding ocean of cash, which at the time accumulated $10 million a year, a fund which gave Hoffa the chance for what he wanted most. Power, control of the pension fund, put him in a position where he wielded a great deal of power. His deal with the mob was that they would help him stay in power if he would let them use the pension funds as a bank. And make investments as they wanted to, and the investments they wanted to make were in Las Vegas to build casinos. Supposedly, anyone should have been able to go before the Teamsters Pension Fund Board of Trustees in Chicago to get a loan. In reality, few people outside the mob ever got the chance. If some outsider thought he was just simply going to submit a package for a loan, and there was just no hope of loan ever being granted, the people who obtained loans had connections with the mob. And it was simple as that. And just as the mob controlled Hoffa, it also controlled many of the other important pension fund trustees. Bill Presser, he was connected with the mob in Cleveland. And then there was uh, Roy Williams, and he was connected with the mob in Kansas City. And uh, they would scratch each other's back. Soon the mob had what it wanted, exclusive control over an endless stream of no-risk capital to build their temples of chance. And then they would use the casinos to rake in cash out of what came in from the casinos. In 1959, a former Cleveland bootlegger turned legitimate businessman named Mo Dalitz became the first one on the strip to benefit from the Teamsters connection. Oddly enough, the loan to Dalitz was not for a casino, but for this hospital. But was it philanthropy or a clever convenience? According to some, the hospital had a secret, more sinister purpose. The story was told to me by a Chicago mob people that what they really had going for them was they would send a man out, he would be met at McCarran Airport, put in an ambulance, driven to Sunrise Hospital, spend a few days there, back in the ambulance, back to the airport, back to Chicago, and that's where the skim was going. Very clever. Put bandages on a guy who's going to check. Presumably by this point, the Nevada Gaming Control Board was checking, making sure that mobsters could no longer be licensed to own a casino, as in the days of Bugsy Siegel. So the mob, and those connected to the mob, such as Mo Dalitz, created a new type of Las Vegas citizen, the front man. Someone who could shield those with shady pasts from the reach of the law. In 1961, Dalitz and his Cleveland mob associates used a second Teamster loan to take over the financially troubled Desert Inn, a hotel casino that had been sitting unfinished on the Strip since the late 40s and owned by a gambler named Wilbur Clark. Immediately, the Cleveland mob sensed that he was going to go under. They came out and offered him a deal he couldn't refuse. They refinanced the hotel, took it over, and he became the front, the host of the hotel. Wilbur Clark was the glad-handing public greeter at the Desert Inn, and it was named Wilbur Clark's Desert Inn. The real owner, Mo Dalitz, did his best to stay in the background and portray himself as a Las Vegas philanthropist, a builder of hospitals. With a wave of the Vegas wand, men like Mo Dalitz, known criminals, were now transformed into the most respectable upright citizens, the American dream, gangster style. They all got into the social registry here, which they couldn't do in Cleveland. You know, the only time they get in the newspaper in Cleveland was when they would be up before a judge. But Dalitz was hardly the only one of them to receive loans. Throughout the 1960s, the pension fund river kept flowing. Though, of course, most loans involved a kickback. I recall that loans were made to the Caesar's Palace, 
Circus Circus, the Fremont, the Landmark, uh, the uh, Riviera, Desert Inn, and those were loans made to front men for the mob, but they had to pay. I mean, you didn't get a free ride. I mean, when you made a, a, obtain a loan from the pension fund, there was invariably the kickback. Shady deals, but the mob was investing in paradise. The thing about, about that era is that it, it signaled the growth of and a maturing of the industry. We're talking about building um, hotels and casinos with uh, golf courses attached, tennis courts, something that looked more like a, a country club than just a sawdust joint from downtown. And none of it could have happened without Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy was a visionary, there's no question about that, and he was, in my judgment, largely responsible for Vegas being what it is today. But let's not lose sight of the fact that those loans were made to mobsters, and uh, that was muscle that he could use. So he was killing two birds with one stone. He was making good loans at the same time, cementing his relationship with these fellas. And let's face it also that he was getting kickbacks. Hoffa was a visionary, just as Dalitz was a visionary. Uh, whether their vision was dark is another thing. Hoffa did a tremendous disservice to truckers across America. Let's face it, he was corrupt. I mean, for all of the, all the good things that happened in Las Vegas, the downside was that the Teamsters have become notorious for a mob connection. Fifty years from now, people will think the Teamsters are mobbed up and, and full of corruption, largely because of the influence of, of Hoffa, Dorfman, and those people. I mean, the, the, the level of evil there is hard to comprehend but it was good for Las Vegas. One of my thoughts when I got there was that the mission of the FBI was to plant the American flag in the Nevada desert because they too would have to own up to being a part of the union. By the late 1950s, no mob family in America could resist the lure of Vegas. Skimming profits from casinos in a city and a state that seemed to thrive on the mystique of gangsters. It was a racketeer's dream come true, especially since law enforcement was not getting in their way. One insight about the mob's role in Vegas emerged in New York City in 1957. Crime boss Frank Costello was being questioned by police after an attempt on his life by a rival mobster. A detective found a curious scrap of paper in Costello's pocket didn't take him long to realize this was the daily take from the Tropicana Hotel and Frank Costello being the, the figures man, the numbers guy for the mob in New York, would get a daily report. Now why would a gangster in New York know what was going on that day in, in, in Nevada? That's just a little bit of a tip of the iceberg. It was obvious to anybody who was involved uh, that uh, that the New York mob was skimming the Tropicana. But let me ask you, who cared? The only people who found that out was the New York City police, and they had no interest in Las Vegas. They could care less. There was no law enforcement organization who was interested investigatively in Las Vegas or whatever the mob was doing. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover was too busy fighting communism to worry about gangsters in Las Vegas. And there certainly was no national anti-gambling legislation. So the FBI had no direct jurisdiction over it. And what they don't investigate, they just don't know anything about. And Nevada was not exactly crusading to kick out the mob. To the contrary, the state of Nevada did very, very little about the involvement. There were a lot of corrupt judges and corrupt uh, public officials during that period of time. And as a result, uh, they took a lot of money from the mob uh, to remain in a situation where the mob could continue to operate uh, free of any regulation whatsoever. Nevertheless, mob corruption in Vegas had been steadily gaining attention on Capitol Hill, and pressure was building to crack down on the state. The essence of the message was either do a better job in Nevada or the federal government will do it for you. A message that rubbed Nevada and its frontier spirit the wrong way. The state of Nevada has always fought very hard to keep the feds out, even in a regulatory manner. Partly this is the, the Wild West, you know, we don't want federal involvement. But even if the FBI wanted to get involved, it did not yet have the key weapon to fight the mob and its frontmen, the legal right to use electronic surveillance. So the feds were stuck. There clearly was secret ownership by the mob 
but the legal weapons weren't really out there that would allow the federal government to get at the secret owners of the uh, mob-run Las Vegas casinos. In 1958, a new governor, Grant Sawyer, took over in Nevada. He made cleaning up the casinos his top priority. From now on, a new gaming commission made up of citizens would regulate the casinos and get the final say on who could own and operate them. He said to the first Nevada Gaming Commission, if there are any hoodlums here, get them out. If they are not here, keep them out. I want you to hang tough. Easier said than done. Since mobsters do not generally cooperate and tell you whether they've got secret ownership, the gaming board needed to go one step further. They created the Black Book, which says certain individuals are so bad that we won't even let them on the casino floor because perhaps they might have secret influence. The idea that the government could create a book, a list of individuals who literally were not allowed to set foot into a casino because they had bad reputations, was a bold and controversial step. You don't have to be convicted of a crime. You don't even, you can be put into the book on hearsay, on evidence that would never be admiss admissible in a court of law. It wasn't long before the Black Book was challenged by one of its first inductees, the Chicago mob enforcer, Marshal Caifano. One of those guys with a lot of notches on his belt uh, for killing people. Very tough, very pugnacious guy. In Vegas, Caifano was a so-called outside man. The muscle needed to enforce whatever the mob's men inside the casino needed done. Furious that the state could exclude him from casinos without notice, Caifano fought the Black Book all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and lost. The United States Supreme Court says, in effect, gambling is a privilege, it's not a right, and if they see it fit to this privileged industry to bar people from entering casinos, they have a right to do it. The Black Book would soon be tested again, this time the right to rub shoulders with a gangster named in the Black Book and still keep a casino license would be tested by none other than Frank Sinatra. Sinatra was making headlines as a singer, entertainer, and as a wild man. I mean, he was breaking windows, he was getting in fights with casino bosses. This guy was the character. Sinatra also owned a casino lodge in Reno called the Cal Neffa. In the summer of 1963, Chicago mob boss Sam Giancana was subpoenaed to testify before a federal grand jury. But Giancana was nowhere to be found. It appeared that he had slipped out of town and was quietly relaxing in a bungalow at Sinatra's Casino Lodge. The board immediately went into action, uh, demanding that uh, Frank Sinatra, if he was catering to Sam Giancana, stop, and that he inform them what was going on. Sinatra's response, a foul-mouthed phone call to the chairman of the Nevada Gaming Control Board. Talk that the chairman later put into written form and at the top it says, obscene, obscene, so anyone who might be easily offended would not read the memo. Grant and Sawyer made a very strong statement that if Frank Sinatra desires to test the might of the state of Nevada, then let him do so. In the end, Frank Sinatra surrendered his license. That was not the end of the story. Sometime later, President Kennedy, who at one point was a close friend of Frank Sinatra, came to the state of Nevada, and he said something like, Grant, what are you doing to my good friend, Frank Sinatra? And Governor Sawyer said, Mr. President, I hope you will take care of national affairs and allow us to take care of the state of Nevada. But President Kennedy's brother, Robert, who had become Attorney General in 1961, was not impressed with Nevada's Black Book. He wanted an all-out battle against organized crime, a battle he'd begun in the late 50s when he took on Jimmy Hoffa in the U.S. Senate. Kennedy was chief counsel to a committee investigating corruption in the Teamsters Union and infiltration by communists. Would you allow as a Teamster official a man who was a communist who was elected by the membership? We don't have any communist in just our Teamsters. Just a moment, please, that I know of. When Robert Kennedy became in as attorney general, he turned to the FBI and said, tell me what's going on. And in fact, their files were largely empty based on his knowledge of what the FBI should know that he learned working for McClellan he insisted that there be an organized crime program and Hoover uh, got off his stuff and went out and created one 
Now the FBI had its marching orders. When Bobby Kennedy became the Attorney General of the United States, we had five agents in Chicago working on organized crime. As soon as he became the Attorney General, we had 70 agents working on organized crime in Chicago. And a big part of our investigation was the Chicago mob's influence and infiltration in Las Vegas. So the feds initiated a new investigation called Vegmon, short for Vegas money. The FBI then went out and put illegal electronic devices in the Fremont, in the Sands, to find what was going on, who owned and, and what was happening to it. And they established the existence of the scam using the electronic surveillance. There was a woman by the name of Ida Devine who took the skim. They were taking all the skim from the different hotels that were mobbed up, taking it to the Fremont, giving it in a suitcase to Ida Devine. She took a train to wherever the hidden points were held. Mostly she would come into Chicago, she'd be picked up, taken to the Ambassador East Hotel under our surveillance, go to the famous pump room, have dinner, deliver the suitcase to the Chicago mob, and the next morning take a train to Miami, to Meyer Lansky, to uh, Cleveland, to New York, to Hot Springs. We followed her all over the country. The only problem, the surveillance was illegal. And in an odd twist of fate, the Department of Justice was not the only arm of the government suspicious about what was happening in the casinos. The IRS had been running its own undercover investigation of possible income tax evasion by the mob casino owners. The Internal Revenue Service was conducting a parallel investigation based on actual observation of the drop at the tables, that is the money being dropped. And they brought a skimming case against a number of the casinos, which was a, truly a threat to some of the owners. But the FBI had made the mistake of using casino employees to staff its own surveillance, employees who were loyal to their bosses and ratted on the FBI. When the owners found out they were being bugged, they threatened the federal government with a lawsuit for invasion of privacy. The illegal electronic surveillance was uncovered, and in a trade, uh, the casino owners gave up the civil suit for invasion of privacy based on the FBI surveillance to not have the lawful Internal Revenue Service skimming cases. Still, the government would have the last word. In 1967, a scathing two-part expose appeared in Life magazine, detailing the mob's activities in Vegas and around the country, as reported by investigative journalist Sandy Smith. In that article, you can see uh, a clear delineation of exactly who owns what, where, and the nature of the skim. I mean, it's just laid out beautifully in, in the article. And somebody wonders well, where Sandy Smith got it from. Well, those people who've been around and have seen the FBI reports and have seen Sandy's stories, sometimes they're the same even to the punctuation. So the Bureau obviously leaked this information. The expose caused such a sensation. It may have forced the mob to sell out. It was the greatest thing ever happened here. He bought all these hotels, and the mob never left. The whole idea that Hughes brought a, a bottle of 409 and cleaned up the town is silly. Late one November evening in 1966, a mysterious, shrouded figure slipped off a private train and into the desert night of Las Vegas. The new arrival, it turned out, was the eccentric billionaire, Howard Hughes. Just as Jimmy Hoffa had funded a wave of casino development, now Hughes would transform Vegas into a corporate town. And like Hoffa, Hughes would leave the mob right where it always was, skimming money from the casino counting rooms. As a young man, Hughes, who made his billions in oil drilling and aviation, had been no stranger to Las Vegas. During the 40s and early 50s, he'd been a frequent visitor. He even rented Bugsy Siegel's old suites at the Flamingo. Hughes saw great potential in Vegas and bought up large tracts of land. He had plans in the back of his head, and I heard him tell, tell us this, that he wanted to build a city here. Not just Las Vegas. His idea of what a city should be like. But at the time, Vegas was a passing fancy for Hughes. By the late 1950s, the aging billionaire had retreated into a life of utter seclusion, one in which only his select Mormon bodyguards were allowed to see him. And only this man, 
Robert Mayhew, the man who had never met his boss in person, was running the Hughes corporate empire. They communicated by phone and letter only. He wanted me to embark on a program with his full cooperation, whereby when I spoke, the world would know that I'm speaking on behalf of Howard Hughes. Then, in 1966, Hughes decided to leave his longtime base of operations in Los Angeles and move temporarily to Las Vegas. He rented the top floor of the Desert Inn. But when Hughes was still there weeks later, owner Mo Delix grew worried. Hughes had never set foot in the casino, and the top floor was in demand by real gamblers, high rollers. And management wanted him out, O-U-T. And I tell him that. And I'd say, Howard, what do you want me to tell them? He'd say, tell them to go to hell. Six months went by. Still, Hughes would not leave. Finally, in March 1967, Mayhew made a fateful offhand comment. And I suggested, jokingly, that if he wanted to have a place to sleep, he'd better buy the hotel. And that's precisely what he did. Hughes bought the Desert Inn from the former Cleveland gangster, Mo Dalis. Then, with loads of money from his recent $546 million sale of Transworld Airlines, he went on a spending spree. Casinos were at the top of his list. After the Desert Inn came the Landmark, the Silver Slipper, the Sands, the Castaways, and the Frontier. It may be just a coincidence, but the hotels that uh, Howard Hughes eventually purchased were all owned by the mob. For its part, the mob had good reason to sell. It was that year that the Life magazine article detailing the intelligence gathered in the Fegwan operation hit the newsstands. Now the heat was on. The mob bosses threatened with the exposure of their frontmen, their skimming racket, and worst of all, their hidden ownership of the casinos, were anxious to sell. The respectable Hughes was the right buyer at the right moment. Nevada officials, anxious to paint an image of Vegas as something other than a mob town, were happy to see a new player getting into the casino act. He was a focal point when it came to people who knew the name, respected the name Howard Hughes. He's in Las Vegas, he's buying hotels. It must be cleaned up and it must be prosperous. The Hughes people did their part to create a new aura of law-abiding management. They hired ex-FBI agents to do the security for these hotels. Now you had security in the parking lots. You had security everywhere you went. And so the story went around, well, gee, now we're honest. We're a corporate town. But even though Hughes bought the hotels, he did not clean house. The mob, which was happy to sell the hotels, maintained its secret control over the real action, the casinos and their river of cash. Some of the operators, uh, some of the floor personnel and the key personnel who were so-called mob people, they were still in. They were still on the casino floor when Hughes took over. The same people were here the day he left that were here the day before he got here, and that's how it works here. Yet for American justice to prove that that's how it worked, law enforcement would have to somehow follow a trail of evidence from the counting rooms back to the mob bosses themselves. If you can't succeed in Las Vegas, you better try something else. I mean, I used to describe Las Vegas as one big blotter. It sucks up every mistake any human being can make. A roll of the dice, a well-played hand, it can make anyone piles of money, part skill, part luck. That would also describe the way law enforcement won its most significant battle with the mob in Las Vegas. The luck was in catching gangsters, talking about the skim, and making the kinds of mistakes that even Las Vegas could not blot out. The skill was in using the tools of American justice to nail the mob bosses who controlled the racket. By the late 1960s, Las Vegas was busy reinventing itself in the image of its favorite billionaire, Howard Hughes. Big companies like MGM and Hilton had figured Hughes was on to something. They said, well, Howard Hughes is doing it. It must be a good idea to do it. But the original investors, in particular the mob families of the Midwest, were still making their money the old-fashioned way. They stole it. 
1968, a professional gambler named Frank Lefty Rosenthal arrived in town. Lefty Rosenthal was sent out to Las Vegas by the Chicago mob to be Mr. Inside, or in other words, to be the Chicago mob's ultimate authority for the skim and for anything else that happened inside the casino. Lefty would rise to the pinnacle of all that Vegas had to offer. Casino manager, married to a beautiful showgirl, hosting a celebrity TV program and swimming in cash. Then, as the feds were closing in on the skimming racket, Lefty would barely escape from Vegas alive. Years later, his story became the basis for the book and the movie, Casino. As a Jewish kid from the tough northwest side of Chicago, Lefty honed his gambling skills in the bleachers of Wrigley Field. In Wrigley Field, there were a group of gamblers, per se, suckers, and then there were the professionals, the non-suckers. I was the sucker. Suckers, as Frank learned the hard way, were the ones who didn't bother to study the odds, who took the wrong side in a bet on whether the next batter would hit a stand-up double. And they sent me home C-O-D. And I'm sure you know what that means. But Frank got wise, so wise that knowing the odds and betting on them became his first profession and his ticket to success. I developed a following as being someone that had some knowledge or success or was lucky and when that happens you become someone that people would like to see one of them was a young man destined for a notorious career as a hitman in the chicago mob anthony spolatro i just met tony somewhat by accident at a very very young age i can't recall specifically the age that we met and we just seemed to click tony was fascinated by the gambling and my ability to predict an outcome of a sporting event. Soon, so was American justice. In 1960, Chicago police arrested Lefty for illegal bookmaking. He avoided jail, but was classified as a known gambler. In 1961, he headed south. I did move to Miami for two reasons. We use the word heat, known gambler. And number two, I didn't like the Chicago weather. But in Miami, the heat would catch Lefty again. He was charged with attempting to bribe a North Carolina college basketball player to fix a game. He pleaded no contest, a charge that would stay on his record and haunt him for years to come. Under the gun, both in Miami and Chicago, there was only one other place for the professional gambler to go, Vegas. Rosenthal claims the move had nothing to do with the Chicago mob. I moved to Las Vegas because it was legal, it was accessible, and you must understand that in order to be successful in, the, in this industry, this being gambling professionally, you've got to be right there. But American justice was one step ahead of him. Before Lefty's arrival, the Chicago Crime Commission sent his rap sheet to the local sheriff, Ralph Lamb, alerting him of Rosenthal's record and reputed mob associations. I just barely got my luggage into the room and I was under arrest, literally and told me to get on that first plane back to Chicago. And then I was reminded that Las Vegas deals in frontier justice, and they reminded me of all the holes in the desert, that I want to become a hole in the desert. Certainly I did not. The sheriff had nothing to hold Lefty for, and Lefty was not scared easily, so he stayed in Vegas. He soon took a job at the blackjack tables in the Stardust, a hotel casino later revealed to be under the jurisdiction of the Chicago mob. Lefty married a topless dancer and casino hustler named Jerry McGee. Then, in 1971, Lefty was reunited with his boyhood friend, Chicago hitman, Tony Spilatro. By now, the FBI, energized by new laws that allowed evidence from electronic surveillance to be used in court, was keeping much closer tabs on known gangsters like Spilatro. Spilatro was sent out by the Chicago mob to be their enforcer, what I call their Mr. Outside, to, to e enforce the edicts of Lefty Rosenthal, who was their Mr. Inside. I've heard he's coming there on my behalf or to represent somebody other than the owners to look out for Frank, which was just totally untrue. Tony came there strictly because Tony uh, recognized, saw the freedom, he saw what I had accomplished, and he wanted to get away from Chicago. 
the people in the mob, and they call him the ant because he killed ten times as many people as anybody else. He worked ten times harder. While Frank Rosenthal and Tony Spilatro had grown up in the same rough Chicago neighborhood, they were fundamentally different. Lefty knew thugs. Tony was one. Just a tough, tough, tough uh, little squirt, but uh, uh, had no qualms about shooting somebody in the back. A man, according to law enforcement, responsible for over 25 murders. A guy who's accused of putting someone's head in a vice and squeezing until the eyes pop out and very grisly murder. In Vegas, Spalatro quickly lived up to his violent reputation. As soon as he arrived in Las Vegas, very shortly thereafter, five bodies wound up in the desert. The ant was the first gangster to break the mob rule that said you don't kill people in Vegas. The mob wasn't doing this for altruistic reasons. It was only so that the high rollers were not disturbed from losing their money at the tables. Spalatro also started a burglary ring known as the Hole in the Wall Gang. His crew stole millions of dollars in cash and jewelry from businesses and private homes. He was that kind of guy. He was a full-out racketeer. For Lefty, the arrival of his boyhood chum only caused him grief. The guilt by association was hard to shake. When violence became, in fact, a part of life, there were accusations made against Tony, and anything Tony did within that state was a reflection on Frank Rosenthal. Rosenthal claims to have been unaware of Spalatro's activities. And Tony never came to me about whatever his aspirations might be or his goals, nor did I. I did my thing, he did his thing. But then Spalatro broke another cherished mob rule. He started sleeping with Lefty's wife, Jerry. There was the situation that became a reality about the the affair, which is a very difficult subject to talk about. Two friends at the height of their powers on the strip, but their lives were spinning out of control. Slowly but surely, the same thing was about to start happening to the mob. And Lefty would watch it all come crashing down, right at the stardust. He owns the casino, but he doesn't control the casino, and he is ordered to stay upstairs. And he doesn't have much choice. A racket as powerful and lucrative as the one the mob had in Las Vegas could survive some internal disputes, such as a Chicago hitman sleeping with the sexy wife of a casino manager. But far more serious would be the exposure of a Vegas frontman. That could reveal the truth behind the glittering facades and compel the mob bosses themselves to face American justice. And so the story of the biggest mob shakeup ever to hit Las Vegas begins with a 31-year-old real estate entrepreneur named Alan Glick. Glick wanted to be a big shot on the strip. But as the saying goes, beware of what you wish for. You might get it. In early 1974, Glick learned that the owners of the Stardust in Fremont Hotel Casinos wanted out. Glick and his little company called Argent wanted in. Seeking a loan, he went to the Teamsters Central States Pension Fund, the fund Jimmy Hoffa set up, that had been helping the Mafia build casinos since the early 60s. The fund manager told Glick to meet with Frank Balistrieri, who happened to be the head of the Milwaukee mob. One of the ways loans were secured from the pension fund was to know the outfit leaders in various cities around the United States who control the individual trustees that voted for these pension fund loans. Balistrieri, for example, controlled a Teamsters trustee, Frank Rainey. If the mob thought the loan made sense, it would use its connections to make sure the pension approved it. Like most major decisions made by mobsters in the Midwest, the Chicago mob would have the final word. Glick met with Balistrieri in Milwaukee in June 74. Balistrieri said he wanted to help the young man get his loan, but to clinch the deal, Glick would have to sign a secret little side agreement. He would have to agree to give Balistrieri's two sons the option to buy half of his company at any time for $25,000.
Glick was stunned. Alarm bells should have gone off in his head, but he needed the loan to fulfill his dream, so he signed. In August 74, the pension fund came through, a whopping 62 and three quarter million dollar loan. Glick was euphoric. Having put up a meager two million in cash, he and his investors were now the proud owners of the Stardust, the Fremont, the Hacienda, and the Marina. Glick, now just 32, was suddenly one of the biggest casino owners in Las Vegas, an heir apparent to Howard Hughes, who had left Vegas four years earlier. The euphoria did not last long. In September, Glick got a call from Balistrieri. As Glick would later reveal, the Milwaukee crime boss wanted him to promote someone in particular to the position of casino manager. Frank Balistrieri informed uh, Alan Glick, you will hire Frank Rosenthal to run the Stardust. Uh, it was very clear to Alan Glick that this was not a request, it was a demand. It was totally untrue, regardless of who said it, when they said it, how many times they said it. I know exactly what happened. I know what position I held when I met Alan Glick. I know there was one man above me in the table of organization. And I know Mr. Glick's choice for promotion was very limited. But from the start, Glick and his apparently well-connected new casino manager just didn't seem to hit it off. Glick began wondering who was really in charge. First of all, the employees are loyal to Mr. Rosenthal. They have no, they're not taking orders from Alan Glick. If he fires them, nothing happens. They don't go away. They continue to operate the casino. Glick challenged him, and Frank Rosenthal basically told him, you know, if you want to live, get out of my way. I'm running things. Only then did Glick realize what was apparent to everyone around him. He had become the mob's frontman. And until they were willing to let him leave, he would have to do as he was told. Lefty Rosenthal, meantime, effectively running the Stardust, earned a reputation as a tough manager. Uh, he was a, uh, uh, a stern taskmaster. Uh, if there was a cigarette that was on the floor, uh, he would pick it up himself and then fire the guy who was supposed to pick it up for him. Uh, people were scared to death of him, and yet they flocked towards him. Lefty also used the threat of violence to keep professional cheaters out of the Stardust and the three other casinos owned by Glick's Argent Corporation. The word got out that the Stardust is not a very healthy place to go to if you're looking to do the wrong thing. We just made sure that we sent you a very strong message, and we asked you to tell your friends, and if you were very, if you had any sense of understanding, and survival, you just wouldn't come back. I think there was an implied threat. But the Nevada Gaming Control Board was keeping an eye on Lefty. Suspecting that he had more power in the casino than he claimed, the board insisted that he register as a so-called key employee. That meant Lefty would have to get a casino license. Fat chance, given Lefty's questionable past and his association with the likes of Chicago hitman Tony Spilatro. When Lefty did apply, the board wouldn't even give him a hearing. By January 1976, he was forced out of the stardust. Lefty claimed he was a victim of injustice. My rights are being violated under the Constitution to bring forth witnesses in order to provide him with a fair hearing. Alan Glick may have been happy to see Rosenthal kicked out, but in late 1975, he was faced with a new and frightening turn of events. One of his early partners, a wealthy San Diego real estate broker named Tamara Rand, was threatening to sue Glick and expose his shady dealings with the Teamsters and the mob. Rand would never get her day in court. On the night of November 9, 1975, she was found dead, shot five times, execution style. She was going to testify against Glick before the Gaming Control Board. The Chicago mob decided that, uh, therefore, uh, she was somebody that was expendable. And so they sent Tony Spilatro, to the best of our information, out to San Diego, where uh, Tamara Rand was murdered. Rand was not the only one to end up dead after interfering with the Chicago mob's interest in the Stardust. In May 76, gaming officials raided the Stardust and uncovered a skimming operation in the slot machines, a racket that allegedly netted over $7 million and was run by a casino employee and professional slot cheat named Jay Vandermark. It seemed that everyone at the casino except Alan Glick 
had known about it. To make it work as a practical matter, virtually everybody knows. I mean, it's, uh, they may not say anything, may not be able to prove it, but they can see how much money comes in. I mean, anybody in management has to know. When Vandermark was implicated, he fled to Mexico. Not long after, he too was killed. So within two years of getting his dream loan from the mob-connected Teamsters Pension Fund, Alan Glick had been linked to at least two murders and one of his casinos exposed in the biggest slot-skimming scandal in Las Vegas history. Things look bad for Glick, but having to reinstate Lefty Rosenthal in early 1977, allegedly at the command of the mob, must have been worse. The Nevada Supreme Court had reversed Lefty's case. He could return to the casino. So Glick was advised not only to bring Lefty back, but to make public statements supporting him. Frank Rosenthal happens to be a very highly competent executive. Are you happy to have Mr. Rosenthal back in the saddle? Certainly I am. My guest is with me tonight. Uh, Mr. Rosenthal, are you back full-fledged into your job, or what are you doing right now? I serve at Mr. Glick's pleasure. And could you describe Mr. Glick's pleasure? You don't have enough time. That's a good answer. We don't have enough time for that. We see you growing more with the uh, with Argent Corporation, taking uh, a higher position, possibly. That's a question for Mr. Glick. Mr. Rosenthal is in as high a position as you can have now. To avoid any new conflict with the gaming board, Lefty now took the position of food and beverage manager. To gaming officials, this looked like a classic cover. Over at the Tropicana Hotel, for example, a Kansas City mob associate named Joe Augusto was running the Follies show as entertainment director. Rosenthal was trying to use the same argument that Joe Augusto used uh, with a licensing board. Hey, I'm just entertainment director. Uh, I'm not running the casino. I don't have to be licensed. Lefty took one more bold step. In April 77, he began hosting a local TV show. Tonight, live, the all-new Frank Rosenthal Show. From the Stardust Hotel in the heart of the Las Vegas Strip, it's the all-new Frank Rosenthal Show. I did not initiate that. I was asked would I be willing, through the publicity department, to accept the show designed around Frank Rosenthal. And that was strictly an attempt by the corporation to try to, for lack of a better word, clean me up. When he had his TV show here, uh, even though people said it was the worst show in the history of the world, everybody stopped what they were doing every Saturday night. If you were out on the strip, they stopped, they turned on a TV set. But the gaming board wasn't fooled, and under pressure to knock heads after the slot skim scandal, they went after Lefty again. This time with shotguns, and were determined to exit me if for any capacity, dishwasher, busboy, you name it. Now Lefty was fighting everyone, including the state of Nevada. And like his old buddy Tony Spilatro, drawing far too much attention to the stardust. Mob guys are satisfied if they get X number of dollars that month. They don't care how they got it, except they want them to do it in a way that's not going to bring unnecessary heat from the Nevada gaming people. And that was the heart of the problem with Rosenthal causing all the extra attention from the gaming authorities. It was potentially interfering with the ability of the mob, the outfit guys, to function, to get their money that they want. Also becoming a nuisance to the mob, frontman Alan Glick, who refused to be the kind of quiet, obedient decoy the bosses needed. There was trouble in the mob paradise, and it was about to burst wide open. The casino is the easiest thing in the world to skin. There are so many ways that money can go out the door that the whole notion of being caught is kind of absurd, but they blew it out of a sense of greed. By 1978, all the chips were falling into place for the mob to take its biggest fall ever in Las Vegas. There was internal strife with frontman Alan Glick. Lefty Rosenthal was losing his all-too-public battle with Nevada gaming authorities. And then, the feds, who knew the mob had been skimming the casinos for decades but still needed solid evidence, got 
very lucky. Not in Vegas, but in Kansas City, where the FBI was busy investigating a series of gangland murders. One of the places they had bugged was this restaurant, a known mob hangout. On the evening of June 2nd, 1978, they heard a cryptic conversation, clearly unrelated to any murder. Picked up uh, conversations about genius, lefty, teamsters, 22 million, 18 million dollars. The FBI agents heard the men saying that someone named Genius had been ordered to get out to make a public announcement that he was leaving. Then something very illuminating happened in Las Vegas. Within a week or 10 days, there was a public announcement by Alan Glick that he was selling the casinos. The mob had forced Glick to sell out, and the feds had it all on tape. At that point, our investigative efforts intensified and shifted gears from looking for evidence of a murder conspiracy to trying to document that the mob controlled the Teamsters Union and used that control and manipulation to gain an inroad into the casinos of Las Vegas. Operation Straw Man was underway, the most extensive FBI wiretap investigation to date. Bugs went into payphones, hotels, homes, even a lawyer's office. The timing was perfect. Mobsters in Kansas City and throughout the Midwest were talking about Las Vegas. At the time all this occurred, there was some inner turmoil among the organized crime groups and their concern about how Alan Glick was or was not following their directions. How Frank Rosenthal was or was not doing what he should be doing at the Arctic Casinos. Gangsters were captured on tape talking in great detail about how they skimmed money from Vegas casinos. And for the first time, references to the bosses in Chicago who had final say over the skim. The single most revealing conversation took place on November 26th at the Kansas City home of Josephine Marlowe, sister-in-law of a local gangster. It places the key people in a single room and there isn't any question what they're talking about. I mean, this is to, how can we loot the casinos? And they're pretty open about it. On the tape, a mob skim expert named Carl Thomas, who worked at the Tropicana, is explaining to the mob's man inside the hotel, Joe Augusto, about the best way to skim. Okay, you go in, fine. It's always been the best. Right. Up until the, the scam in Argentina, everybody was making some money. Sure. Man, with that scam, again, the heat comes down and put a new regulation. But you can still beat it if you got the control. At the Marlowe meeting, the Kansas City mobsters were handling a sensitive internal problem at the Tropicana, a hotel casino in which they had the largest stake. They suspected that some of their people in Vegas, whose job it was to steal the skim money from the casino, were keeping some for themselves. The mob called it leakage. Uh, they take the money to go and it down, boom, 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 boom. Now, the bad part about that system, if they say they're taking 2,000 a day, they can be taking 24 hours. To solve the leakage problem, Kansas City mob boss Nick Savella first wanted to get an accurate account of the casino profits. So he called a moratorium on skimming at the Tropicana. Mob associate Joe Augusto, who served as the hotel's entertainment director, even suggested a new skimming racket to boss Nick Savella. Siphoning profits from the Lido show at the Stardust and the Folly show at the Tropicana. I think that the Stardust uh, could generate a million dollars a year, you know, without any sweat. And, uh, and the, uh, and the Club of Canada, they did, you know, half a million dollars a year. And the way you're making it sound like you think that's a lot of money. Uh, but the Stardust could generate a million a year. The impression we got from that is that the size of the scam was probably a lot larger than we imagined. By February 1979, the FBI had what it needed to take Operation Strawman to the next step. On Valentine's Day, agents executed search warrants in Las Vegas, Kansas City, and elsewhere. During a search at the home of Kansas City mob accountant Carl DeLuna, the feds found their next pot of gold. He was the keeper of the funds. He kept such meticulous records. Most uh, business concerns would be happy if their employees kept such good records. DeLuna used code names to record who got the skim money 
and what hotel casinos the skim was from. There was a record of monthly payoffs made to former Teamsters president, Roy Williams. Dulena also kept notes on meetings he and boss Nick Sabella had with leading Chicago mob figures, including boss Jackie Cerrone, hitman Tony Spilatro, and the mob's key man at the Teamsters pension fund, Alan Dorfman. Rarely do mobsters do the FBI's work for it so thoroughly. It told a very beautiful story. Uh, it told a very accurate story. Now came the long, hard work of telling that story to juries. An eight-year marathon of American justice, run by lead prosecutor David Helfrey. At its climax in the fall of 1985, the shadowy men who controlled the skim at the Stardust Casino, men like Chicago bosses Joey Ayupa, Jackie Sarong, as well as Milwaukee boss Frank Balistrieri, would stand trial. Clearly missing from the list of defendants, Frank Lefty Rosenthal, even though his name did appear on the skimming notes kept by mob accountant Carl DeLuna. While there was occasional mention of Frank Rosenthal, uh, it wasn't specific as to a, any particular act. And collectively, they, the attorneys felt there was insufficient evidence. American justice spared Lefty. He would never have to testify under oath about what happened to him in Las Vegas and whether he really did wield his power in the casinos through the Chicago mob. Others were not so lucky. One of the most compelling prosecution witnesses was former Teamsters president Roy Williams. Two years earlier, in 1983, Williams had been convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison, along with Teamsters insurance broker Alan Dorfman for attempting to bribe U.S. Senator Howard Cannon of Nevada. Dorfman never made it to his prison cell. The Chicago mob had made sure of that. They just got concerned that he might become a witness. And so, yeah, he was murdered in Lincolnwood by two gunmen in the parking lot in broad daylight. But Roy Williams was not seen as a threat. The mob let him serve his time. Now, two years later, aging and ill, he decided to rat on the mob in hopes of reducing his sentence. Williams testified that as a trustee of the Teamsters Central States Pension Fund, he had voted in favor of the nearly $63 million loan to Alan Glick's Argent Corporation to purchase the Stardust and other casinos, and that for doing so, he had received payments of $1,500 a month from Kansas City boss Nick Savella. Here's a fellow who ties the union, the mob, and Las Vegas skimming in, the, in one person. And a person who can't really be effectively doubted. Um, one, there's too much evidence. I mean, we've got the Luna's notes. And so he embodies it all, and all of this crushing evidence surrounding it makes it impossible to disbelieve him. But the most damning testimony of all would come from the front man himself. Early on, the feds had concluded that Alan Glick was more victim than perpetrator. He was not charged with any crime. When he took the stand in November 1985, he told his story of life as a mob frontman. According to Glick, almost from the start, his relationship with Lefty Rosenthal was a problem. That he had tried to fire Lefty until one day in the Stardust coffee shop, Lefty set him straight. When he wanted Rosenthal out, he was told in no uncertain terms that he didn't control the casino. Glick testified that Lefty threatened his life, warning, quote, if you interfere with any of the casino operations or try to undermine anything I want to do here, you will never leave this corporation alive. Alan Glick should be a screenwriter or a director or go to Universal Studios. It never took place. But according to Glick, it got worse. He testified that in March 1975, he received a call from Rosenthal demanding an immediate meeting in Kansas City. Glick protested, but was convinced to get on the company plane was met at the airport by Lefty Rosenthal and mob accountant Carl DeLuna. They took him to a nearby hotel and led him into a room. Glick was literally put in a, a straight-back chair, uh, dark all around him, light focusing on Alan Glick, and that's how he met Nick Savella. During the meeting, Nick Savella made it very clear to Alan Glick that he had no use for him. He didn't like him. And if it was totally up to him, he not, might not be walking out of the room alive. And uh, he was told what would happen 
if he continued to resist Frank Rosenthal. Alan Glick has a very, very strong imagination, wonderful fantasy, and it sounds good, but it never, ever took place. I had never pushed Alan Glick anywhere other than upward. The only thing I did for Alan Glick was increase the profits in the bottom line. That's a matter of record. Glick told the court that finally, in April 1978, he was summoned to a meeting in the Las Vegas office of defense attorney Oscar Goodman. And that when he arrived, Rosenthal was there, and Carl DeLuna was seated with his legs up on the lawyer's desk. DeLuna informed Glick that he and his partners were finally sick of him, and that it was their desire that he sell out. Then DeLuna read off the names and ages of Glick's young children. Alan Glick, based on that threat, did exactly what he was told within the time period he was told. With Glick's testimony, the government had made its case. The defense had little of substance to offer. But not all the justice was being meted out in the courtroom. The mob failed in their job. They permitted the only, and certainly the most extensive, penetration by the government of this whole operation that had ever occurred to date. When the Argent trial finally ended in January 1986, all the defendants, including Chicago mob bosses Joey Ayupa and Jackie Saron, were found guilty of conspiring to conceal their ownership of the Stardust Casino and of skimming casino profits. Prison terms ranged from 16 to 28 and a half years. Separately, the Kansas City mobsters had faced American justice for their part in the skimming of the Tropicana Hotel. Among the defendants, mob notekeeper Carl DeLuna pleaded guilty. Kansas City boss Nick Savella was indicted, but died of cancer before the trial began. Charges were dropped against skim expert Carl Thomas and Tropicana inside man Joe Augusto in return for their testimony. But outside the courtroom, the deadly rules of mob justice had still been in effect. On the evening of October 4th, 1982, after a quiet dinner at a Las Vegas restaurant, Frank Rosenthal got into his Cadillac. As he turned the key in the ignition, he saw flames. I don't have a total memory. You don't really remember everything that took place. I was on my way home, and I heard the kaboom. And I looked over, and there's this car on fire. I remember escaping. I'm not sure what happened before I escaped. I saw Mr. Rosenthal jumping out, and he's here sort of standing up, and his eyes are very wide, and he's very excited. I wasn't even conscious of the fact that there was a bomb until I was out of the car and heard the secondary explosion. And uh, that was a, it was a blow, physically and mentally. Frank does not speculate publicly about who wanted him dead. The car bombing remains unsolved. But two factors point to the mob. Frank had been named an Operation Strawman and could easily have been seen as a potential rat. Secondly, Rosenthal had a violent enemy in his former friend Tony the Ant Spalatro, the Chicago hitman who years earlier had an affair with Frank's wife, Jerry. The FBI speculated that hard feelings between the two men may have led to the bombing. It was not long after the attack that Jerry, who had since been divorced from Frank, had a fatal drug overdose. Jerry died approximately four to six weeks after I was bombed. There is no correlation to that. The fate of Tony Spilatro completed the circle of death and violence. Spilatro had been indicted in Operation Strongman. Due to bad health, he did not face trial. But wiretaps of Tony denigrating fellow mobsters had been played in court. Then, in 1985, Spilatro faced charges for the vicious murder of a government witness whose head Tony had allegedly crushed in a vice. The Chicago mob had seen and heard enough from Tony the Ant. In June 86, he and his brother Michael, who was also awaiting trial for extorting prostitutes, were driven to an Indiana cornfield four miles from a farm owned by former Chicago boss Joey Ayupa, who was now in prison. In the cornfield, Tony and Michael Spilatro were stripped, tortured, and beaten viciously, then dumped in a hole. Nine days later, their bodies were discovered by a farmer working the field. The coroner could not decide how they were killed, 
they, but except for the fact that they were suffocated either from the blood that they swallowed from the beating that they took in their face or suffocated because they were buried alive in a shallow grave in northern Indiana. After the Argent trial, frontman Alan Glick's motto could have been living well is the best revenge. He sold his Vegas holdings for more than 70 million. And despite having ratted on the mob, he has survived without incident. He's been very fortunate. All the way around. I mean, the government could have taken a, a different attitude towards him as well. The man Glick sold out to, Alan Sachs, was himself alleged to have had strong ties with organized crime. Following new allegations of skimming at the Stardust, Sachs was forced out, and Nevada officials took over the casino. Lefty Rosenthal, meantime, had retired to run a bar and restaurant in Boca Raton, Florida. But he went on to fight one more losing battle in Las Vegas. In 1988, Nevada officials put Rosenthal in their infamous Black Book, which meant Lefty was permanently barred from all Vegas casinos. It's strictly politically motivated, and I understand why, because all you need to do in Las Vegas, Nevada, is just raise the name Frank Rosenthal, and you become a shining star overnight. According to Lefty, he has not let the black book keep him from doing what he once loved best, being part of the Vegas action. Well, I could sneak in. Oh, he didn't know that. I'm capable of wearing a, a beard and a wig and a mustache, just like anybody else is. I mean, piece of cake. Well, I sneak in and out of Vegas all the time. But as a result of the Argent skimming trials, the Vegas Lefty sneaks into may no longer be a town ruled by the mob. It pretty well decimated them. It exposed the corrupt connection between the Teamsters, Las Vegas, and the mob, and hopefully led to new groups of people going into Las Vegas without the mob connections. It can't be a family town and be mob controlled. The Stratosphere Tower, it's not just a tower. A tower anybody can have. A tower with its own roller coaster, a thousand feet in the air, that's Las Vegas. While law enforcement did its part to push the mob out of Vegas, a more powerful force, capitalism, gave it an even more decisive shove. In the years following Operation Strawman, which exposed the mob's hidden control of Las Vegas casinos, a new power emerged on the Strip, the power of Wall Street. By then, Vegas had lost its monopoly as the country's gambling mecca. In 1976, New Jersey had legalized casino gambling in the resurrected seaside resort of Atlantic City. The governor sent a clear message to the mob. Keep your filthy hands out of Atlantic City. Keep the hell out of our state. New Jersey set up tough regulations to back up that message and keep organized crime out of the casinos. As soon as you have New Jersey gambling, Nevada has to be careful not to approve anybody that New Jersey rejects. Vegas was also forced to compete for customers. To meet the challenge in the 1980s, a new generation of corporate investors emerged in Las Vegas, true heirs to the legacy of Howard Hughes. Men like Steve Wynn, who opened the first of a new wave of family-oriented resort casinos, the Mirage, in 1989. Out front, a volcano that erupts every 15 minutes. Where did the modern money come from? The money to build uh, the Mirage, for example. It came through junk bonds. It came from Wall Street. It's Mike Milken uh, processing junk bonds that builds the modern no longer would the gleaming new palaces be built with mob-connected Teamster loans. Now there was a new river of cash. You can issue stock and bonds. You don't need the Teamsters. With the conservative values of Wall Street came a push to cleanse the image of Vegas, to make it a family town. The strategy worked. Las Vegas became the entertainment capital of America and one of the nation's fastest growing cities. When Steve Wynn sold off the Mirage a decade later, he was bought out not by an old New York family, but by Hollywood billionaire Kirk Kerkorian. Along the way, vestiges of the old Vegas would be swept away. Among them, the landmark, 
once owned by Howard Hughes. We tear history down regularly, and there's a reason for that. Because you have certain people who want to forget it, who want you to forget where we come from. Those who had built Vegas, including former bootlegger and entrepreneur Mo Dalitz, also seemed eager to erase their mob-connected past as well. What do you say to those allegations of organized crime ties? This interview was not supposed to touch on personalities or personal things. So I must ask you to forgive me for not answering you. But in a town built on a mythology of sin and forbidden fantasy, could the Vegas of family theme parks really be the key to the future? Many people went to Las Vegas precisely because there was this ambience of mob control. They wanted to be near it but not touch it. If what you do is make Las Vegas just another corporate Disneyland, you will leave that mob ambience. Now, that surely will destroy the old Las Vegas. By the mid-90s, Las Vegas seemed to be returning to at least some semblance of its former self. The casinos want high rollers much more than they want seven-year-olds. And the convention authority, their advertising model is Las Vegas 24 hours. That doesn't suggest kiddies. They don't want to eliminate the dark mystery. You know, Las Vegas is a town built on that darkness. And it's, and it's a celebration of vice. The last thing the average person who comes to Las Vegas wants is Chuck E. Cheese. They don't want to have a place full of children. Las Vegas voters have also seemed ambivalent about the aura the mob brought to their town. In 1999, defense attorney Oscar Goodman, a man dubbed the mouthpiece for the mob, for defending men like Tony Spilatro and Lefty Rosenthal, was elected mayor. But by all accounts, Goodman's former clients have little to do with today's Las Vegas of larger-than-life theme parks, art museums, and Broadway-style shows. To my knowledge, there is no Bob that exists in Las Vegas as we sit here this moment. If there is, no one ever told Frank. The best thing that can be said that it's inconclusive in some areas. I mean, they're in restaurant ownership and in things like that. Inside the casino, things are a lot more sophisticated. You wouldn't expect to see a dinosaur roam the earth today and that's kind of what the old guys are.